sort of gathering scenario where not only our lives but our entire economy may be changed by genomics in the way it was changed over the last 30 years by the digital revolution and so i want to bring in andrew hessel live from uh, uh, california to discuss that andrew has many hats he's a microbiologist and entrepreneur the co-author of a book called the genesis machine our quest to rewrite life in the age of synthetic biology andrew are you with us can you hear me I am. Hi, Bruno. Good, Excellent. Good afternoon. Hi, Andrew. Andrew, it has been about a couple of decades since uh, the Human Genome Project, and uh, the cost of an individual sequencing of a genome went down from many thousands of dollars to just a few hundreds. Now we have factories that uh, sequence genomes, and uh, I've I've heard you talk about this in terms of a uh, genomics economy based on genomic networks. Tell us what you mean by genomics economy. Well, sequencing any genome costs money. Again, as you alluded to, the, the very first ones cost millions of dollars. The f very first one cost a billion dollars. But now it's, it's sub $1,000 and we can extract a lot of value out of this genomic information. We're just learning how to interpret it and extract value for both health and potentially economy, uh, whether it's medicine development, whether it's, whether it's understanding how our, um, how our various traits link to uh, the way a drug is developed and, and so on. So there is an emerging biological economy coming from the world of genomic sequence information. Now, you sent us a slide, which you're going to project now, that basically tries to describe how the actual value of the sequence, the genome, is way higher than the cost to sequence that. Describe and decrypt this, this graph for us. Okay, the, the line that's sloping downward is the cost of DNA sequencing, which again has exponentially decreased faster than Moore's law. So we, we've, seen, we've seen the cost of sequencing plummet. We crossed an inflection point several years ago where the value that we can extract from the average genome exceeds the cost of sequencing if it's amortized over a few years. What this, what this produces is the potential for a positive feedback effect where a company, for example, can come along and say, we will sequence you for free because they know how to extract more value out of your genome in terms of these various uh, uh, types of opportunities, diagnostic tests, personalized medicine, et cetera, that now creates a runaway effect where they can keep adding people to their network and generating a surplus economically every time. I'm expecting this to tip over any sometime soon. And when it happens and is done well, in the same way that Google and Facebook have learned to, to generate economy from their participants, we're going to see uh, essentially billions of people and their genomes come online in a very this is due to happen we're, we're poised on this economic cliff now so uh, are you saying that we're gonna kind of go from big tech to big gen and these companies are kind of kind of control that value the, there's there's a real possibility of that what we've what we're already seeing with some of the companies on the forefront of genome sequencing is they're making it very clear that this is your data this is your program essentially but they're acting more as an agent or a representative or or knowledge extractor and they'll split the profits in the same way that apple splits the profits from software developers on their platform so but it, you know, they can optimize for different things, whether it's you want to get your best health information or whether you want to make more money from your genome. But there, there, it looks like it, there's an, uh, there will be a big gen company, what I described in an article is the Google of genomics um, poised to appear. So another topic that you've been uh, um, writing about and talking about is digital twins. Explain what you mean and how that relates to health. Well, in the same way that your genome really represents your program, we're leaving more and more digital information in our lives today, whether it's our emails, our social media, et cetera, et cetera. All of that information can be gathered and, and collected to make a very good 
digital representation of you, almost a digital twin. This can go down at a systems level, your whole body, if your body's been scanned, right down to the cellular level today, which you can think of as a virtual twin of a, of, of a living cell, which is now increasingly testable. So these digital twins, or you can think of them as avatars, are going to become much more important for understanding uh, a, an individual, their health, their development, um, their metabolism, and so on. So this is, where we, this is um, going to be, I believe, one of the main applications of AI analysis and, and the incredible amount of digital information that we're collecting about each other. Andrew, you're, you're involved with a company that uh, works on developing new viruses, and the uh, intention is to attack cancer cells. And uh, what you do is basically programming a, a, a virus, is, is a work based on data. Now, if we can program a virus with benign intent, that probably means that we can also program one with malicious intent. Are we entering a time of very easy virus design? Yeah, so I, I've been working in the field of synthetic biology now for over a decade, which is really learning how to program biological systems. And the easiest things to program, because they have the smallest programs, uh, are viruses. And, and you ha I look at viruses as essentially USB sticks, memory drives, um, that need a cell, uh, which you can think of as a computer, to execute the programs, but they're very specific for plugging in. So we design viruses that when they, when they dock with a cancer cell, essentially load a program that says, cancer cell, you need to die. Um, but just like software that we may have on a, a computer software on a USB stick, it can deliver a useful program or it can deliver malware. So I think we're in probably the most um, significant period in biotechnology for the next 20 years where we have to figure out the right systems to, per, to drive it towards positive applications and minimize the potential for, for biological hacking, so to speak. Are those 20 years only significant or also problematic and risky? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it, there, we're at this point where it's very, uh, the tools for designing these very simple agents, viruses and other infectious diseases are becoming, um, are, are now accessible and affordable for a larger group of people, raising the possibility of hacking. But these tools can also be one of the most powerful uh, tools for, for medicine, for uh, climate change and, and for manufacturing because cells uh, really are, are the most efficient and sustainable form of making the things that humans need, whether it's food or medicines or materials. I'm gonna ask you a question about climate change in a sec, but uh, you were recently here in Geneva for a conversation and a conference about science and policy. How solid is our policy process and infrastructure to confront, to understand and confront the things you have been discussing so far? Well, you know, there's there's policies that have been in place for managing for managing economies, for imagine, for for managing science and large groups of science like CERN, um, the and 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 politics, uh, just the relationships between countries. I don't think these systems that we have today, which are very high touch, often very personal, very paper based, are going to work. For these digital for digital biology, um, this digital biology can move at the speed of software because you can think of the cells as the computers. They're already there. They're just waiting for us to be able to write better programs. I think we're going to need a digital layer of these types of uh, of, of regulatory mechanisms. Um, that are working 24-7 in real time alongside these digital tools in the same way that the internet today has a, has a digital security layer that keeps all of our systems up and running in the background that is really not transparent to the person sitting down and, and accessing a website or their bank, etc. Andrew, one last question. You mentioned climate change. And of course, when we talk about uh, sequencing a genome, we are not only talking about the human genome, we are talking about all of, of life. To what extent do you think genomics can help us confront the climate and uh, biodiversity crisis? 
I think it's the most powerful technology that we have. We're, we're, we're as successful as we are today because of, uh, you know, we've, we've used natural resources heavily to, to build society. Now I think we're coming around and realizing all these ecosystems, all these organisms are really important. We don't know that much about them. So there's efforts today to go in and collect genomes from every known species, sequence them, archive them, biobank them, and soon we'll actually start to engineer them to to help replace endanger to help prop up endangered species, even um, de-extinct some of the recently lost species. But more than that, start to use these biotechnologies, engineer them precisely in controlled environments to help to help um, produce the things that we need. Um, uh, for the future in a much more sustainable way than we've been able to do in the past with chemical technologies. So I, I look at it as a shift from natural resources to supernatural resources. And genomics is going to be a major part of that work. Andrew, thank you for being with us and sharing your knowledge with this, this uh, audience. Thank you very much. Andrew Hassan. Thank you so much.